Okay guys, let's talk about wheat berries. Yes, wheat berries. Hi, I'm Kara with Grains and Small Places. Nice to meet you and thanks for coming back if this isn't your first time. And who knew that we could do a whole video just about wheat berries, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of information out there about all the different wheat berries and the different varieties and what we use them for and what their characteristics are and their properties and I'm just going to go over that today and let's get started. Okay, so today I'm going to be going over the different kinds of wheat berries. So as you can see, these are my little containers that I keep them in for everyday use so that I can just dip my measuring cups right out and and keep them on my counter and that way they are oops, gently that way they are easily accessible so that I can use them in my recipes um, I do have some five gallon buckets as well that I keep larger amounts stored in. Yes, I keep all of this in my RV. As we travel around the United States, we just make it work somehow, I guess. Um, but I've had a lot of questions about that. Maybe we'll give an RV tour if, if there's any interest in that. I guess let me know in the comments uh, below. If you prefer to see this information in written form or you want to know more information or dive deeper or find links of different recipes that are great for each of the grains or where to find different grains because there are some wheat berries that I've ordered and I have not been happy with and there's wheat berries I've ordered and been happy with. So if you ever see a link at my blog or a link in my YouTube video description box, it's going to be something that I've used or recommend. I'm never going to link something that is no good or I found is a bad quality. That doesn't mean that if I link something in the next year or something I have breaks or changes that that could happen obviously but as of the time when I put the link in it's good to go and I've already tried that brand or that type or whatever. So I just wanted to go over that for you. I will put a link to the blog post below going over this information and probably a little bit more in detail. You can head over to grainsandsmallplaces.net. That's where you can find th this information and a whole bunch of recipes. All my recipes are dedicated to 100% fresh milled flour. I have some sourdough recipes there and some non-sourdough recipes there. Okay, so let's jump into the hard wheat varieties. So the hard wheat varieties are going to be the wheat varieties that you wanna use to make yeast risen bread or sourdough risen breads that you want a good rise, stretchy gluten, soft and squishy, any of the, those properties. So primarily the hard wheat varieties most commonly are your hard white wheat and your hard red wheat. At the end, I'll go over with you some of my favorite blends that I like to use. Um, oftentimes I won't use just all of one kind of wheat berry. So the hard white wheat is going to be one of the most common wheats, I think, and it's also one that is recommended for beginners, but also for experienced bakers. It is a great wheat. If you could only have just one kind of wheat in your pantry or at your house, or you only have room for one or can only afford one, that might just be the one that I recommend. I do have um, a family that I know and love dearly, my sister's family, who they, for about a year only had hard white wheat, like a prairie gold version of it, and they got it from a local Amish store. And they were able to make breads, they were able to make cookies, brownies, uh, pancakes, waffles, they made everything with the hard white wheat. Everything turned out great. So if you can only do one or you're just getting started and you wanna know which one you should buy, that's probably one of the ones I would recommend to try first. Then we go into the hard red wheat. Both of these wheats are high in protein and are able to form gluten pretty readily. And that way you can have your glutinous breads with the nice rays and all of that. So your hard red is going to be similar to the hard white. The main difference with those is gonna be the color difference. It's a little bit more red or I guess it makes sense since it's called hard red, but it, it makes your, your bread more brown in color so it has that traditional like whole wheat look to it even though all of the breads that we're making even when you're using white wheat red wheat any of those wheats 
they're all technically whole wheat because we're milling the whole berry, putting the whole grain into our bread. So all of them are technically whole wheat bread, but the hard red tends to give us that color that we're used to with the store-bought bread that looks like whole wheat or whole grain bread. Okay, so then we can go into the soft wheat and generally that covers a soft white wheat and a soft red wheat. And the soft wheats are going to be better for cookies, pastries, cakes, muffins, quick breads, most of the things that we don't need to form gluten. And it just makes a softer product, I guess I, the best way to explain it. So if you could only have two wheats on hand, then I would probably say the soft white wheat and the hard white wheat would be great ones to start with. They're a little bit um, easier to work with. They're easier to find recipes for that are specific to those different kinds of wheat so that it's gonna be a little bit easier for you to start transitioning and then you can start playing with all kinds of different flavors and textures and all of the great things about each of the different grains. I personally have not worked with soft red wheat before. I hear that it is much more sort of that whole wheat look to it. It is darker in color like the hard red wheat is. Um, but this one I personally have not used. Uh, I imagine it could be used in place of any recipe that calls for soft white wheat, probably one-to-one -one, you know, ratio, same amounts, just like hard white and hard red are pretty much interchangeable, just depending on the recipe and what results you're looking for. So the next section I wanna dive into is the ancient grains. And these are kind of special, different wheat varieties. These ancient grains are grains that are kind of the original wheats or wheats before any modernization has come about. Two of the oldest wheats that at least I know of that I've read about are einkorn and emmer. I have not personally worked with emmer either. I would love to work with that because I've heard great things about it, but I'm having a hard time finding that. <laughs> einkorn, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with. It is a little bit trickier to work with. There are a lot of other content creators out there that have beautiful einkorn loaves and beautiful einkorn recipes. I do have a few einkorn recipes, but I find that it can be tricky to work with, so it's not one I would recommend starting with unless you're exclusively going to bake with einkorn, then you could learn to bake with einkorn and not have to worry about messing with the other ones. Because I have spoke to people before that start with einkorn and say that the other wheats are a little bit different, difficult to work with. So I guess to each his own, I'm glad there's all kinds of different wheat varieties out there for all the different bakers, all the different tastes and flavors that we all kind of like something a little bit different. So, einkorn, I find if you overwork it or you knead it a lot, which if, if you've watched any of my bread recipes, you'll see that I tend to knead longer than the average baker just because I really like the results that it gives me. So, if I do this with einkorn, it turns very gluey and gloppy and it's just not fun to work with. So, I do, like I said, have a few einkorn recipes. It is a great grain. It is a, has a lovely flavor. It is probably one of the smallest of the wheat berries um, when you're just looking at an actual whole grain kernel. I will make muffins and cookies with it. I have not had a whole lot of success making breads with it, but that doesn't mean I never will. I may try it again. <laughs> I probably will try it again. <laughs> anyway, okay, on to Kamut or Corrigian wheat. Um, I generally call it Kamut just because that's what I was taught that it was called, but technically that is the brand name, not the type of wheat. That is probably the largest kernel, and it is also an ancient grain, and this happens to be probably one of my favorite wheat varieties to throw into recipes, and it makes fantastic pasta. <laughs> so I do have a link for pasta, a, a great pasta recipe down below if you want to venture into making pasta. And it can be used with homemade pasta or it can be used in a pasta machine or it can be used with the KitchenAid pasta attachment and the hand roller 
all the different pastas. It is a great recipe because it's pretty versatile. So Kamut has a golden hue, has tons of amino acids, tons of protein, great, wonderful grain. I do have also a recipe that you can make 100% Kamut bread with. It's not as light and fluffy as the hard white wheat breads because it doesn't form as strong of gluten. So it does have some gluten in it and it does have a high protein content, but it's not a strong gluten. So it has a hard time holding itself up. So oftentimes I will mix it in with my sandwich breads and I love to add it into my pizza dough. So it really just adds a, just a special touch and a great golden color to anything that you're wanting to bake. And then here comes spelt. Spelt is another ancient grain. It also is high in protein, lower in gluten, so it's kind of difficult to make a stretchy, soft bread with 100% spelt. It can be done, but generally I will add it in with some of my hard varieties. The hard white is usually what I'll end up putting it in. But spelt makes amazing waffles. So I do have a waffle recipe down, I'll put it I'll try to remember to link all of these recipes down below. If not, you can head over to my blog and all of the recipes that I talk about are over there. But also Spelt is fantastic in muffins and quick bread. I really love to add it in almost all of my muffins and quick breads, whether it be partial or all. Spelt has a phenomenal flavor and it tends to be one of the favorites as far as texture and flavor goes. Um, in fact, I did do a little poll and I believe Spelt won when I asked people what their favorite grain was. It seems to be that Spelt was the number one winner. If you don't agree with that and you want to vote too, you can head over to the community tab when this video is over and stick your vote in for which grain you prefer the most. Mine happens to be the Kamut but spelt would probably be a close second to that. But neither of those grains would make my light fluffy bread without my beloved hard white wheat. So that's gotta be probably my third favorite. But generally I will mix many of them and I'll talk about that later. And then like I said, there is emmer also and that one I don't have a lot of experience with so I can't really talk about what to use it for but if I do get it, you will be the first to know because I'm sure I'll put a video out on it making something with it or we'll, we'll see what the future holds. <laughs> okay, well, I'm trying to remember the next category. Let's jump over and see what's happening with the cabin edition. Okay, so some changes are happening. Let's go check out and see what it looks like inside. I hear there's drywall. This is the new entryway I watched us walk through and we've got all the drywall, a little temporary light fixture. The drywall looks is all done and Matt has it all sanded and ready to paint. So some of you may know or this may be a new story for you, but while I was growing up, my dad used to fix up houses. <laughs> he was, I guess, one of the original fixer-uppers, if you can say, fixed up houses before it was on TV, before it was a thing, before people realized what that even was. Um, so when I, kid, when I was a kid, people would ask me, what does your dad do for a living? And I'd say he rehabs houses or flips houses and nobody was everybody was like what nobody really knew what that meant now pretty much everybody knows what that means <laughs> but along the lines when i was a kid i learned many great skills and this is one of them <laughs> and he's taught me a lot and thank you dad along the lines of that matt and i actually met because he worked for my father <laughs> in fixing up houses and doing remodeling and carpentry and just contracting and different works and stuff like that. So yeah, I know, boss's daughter, right? But <laughs> but that's just a fun little story about how we met and first got to know each other. Okay, so while we were putting on the addition, we also had to do some um, other things inside the existing cabin. So this kitchen was already here. They did that, we did that last year um, when they moved in, but let me show you what we've started around in the finished portion of the cabin. 
So we went ahead and pulled up the old flooring um, because it was gapping and stuff. And we're going to try to reuse some of this flooring here. And then we're going to end up moving, the, uh, adding two windows here for the dining room. And this wall is going to end up being eliminated so that this whole room here becomes all one. This is the little bedroom that they were in before. And then that'll all be one. And then down this hallway, that's where the new addition is. And that's where their bedroom will be. That way they have a nice big, not big, but bigger living room where they can have guests and people can come over and hang out. Okay, we're at the end of week six of working on this cabin edition. I wanted to show you the progress. Um, I know you've seen little tidbits here and there of what's going on. So let's take a look. This is where the, I'm in the existing cabin and this used to be a window to the outside. So this is now the new edition. And you can see, obviously it's not finished, but we've got our drywall, our paint, everything's good. We still need light fixtures. Um, the flooring is in, the windows are all trimmed out, everything's trimmed. We went with this um, raw pine trim to go with, you can see in the old cabin how it had a lot of the pine wood in it, so it kind of was more cohesive. And the flooring turned out really beautiful. All in all, great progress being made. And then after, Today we're gonna to move some of the stuff from the existing portion of the cabin into this new section. That way we can start getting to work. Um, when You can see the ripples in the floor here. The flooring people that put this in last year put it over some stuff that needed some underlayment under it. Also, we wanna be able to have a smooth transition here from this new floor to the old floor. So we're gonna take up all the flooring put new underlayment down and then put the flooring back down and then hopefully the waves in the floor, this is like a vinyl floor, so vinyl plank floor. This one is not click lock, this one is. We'll see how they hold up, I don't know. We've had mixed results with that kind of flooring. <laughs> so we'll see if that helps these lay down in the future. Okay, and then I guess there's just another category of just random wheat varieties, I guess. Um, and the first would be Durham wheat. And Durham is a very hard grain, but it's not gen not necessarily one that you would make bread out of. It kind of has a special property because it's specifically kind of a pasta wheat variety. It also is the wheat that we get um, semolina from. And I have made pasta with Durham and it is wonderful, but I will say that I tend to like the Kamut pasta just a little bit better. <laughs> it's just a little bit more tender, a little bit easier to work with, and I just I just love the golden hue and that buttery flavor. I can't even explain it. You'll have to try it, <laughs> but Durham makes also fantastic pasta. That's actually the traditional wheat that they've used for hundreds of years to make pasta. And then the last one I'm gonna talk about today is rye. And rye has almost a green color to it. So it has a really pretty greenish hue to it. And it has a hearty, earthy flavor. Now, generally, I am not a strong rye bread flavor fan, if that's even a correct sentence, <laughs> but I did find out in making all of these grains that the the traditional rye flavor that we're always tasting is actually the caraway seeds that you add into the recipe and that makes it that stronger flavor. So I have a pumpernickel recipe that I use some rye in and it is fantastic. And rye is not something that I would recommend to make bread because it has a very low gluten content as well. It just doesn't form that stretchy gluten that we're always looking for for when we're making a nice bread loaf. Another special thing about rye, if you're interested in sourdough or if your sourdough starter is kind of lazy or not very active, you can add some fresh milled rye flour into your sourdough starter and generally it will just come alive. <laughs> it really likes rye. I'm, rye just has a lot of natural sugars in it and some beneficial organisms that are just naturally in rye that just make your sourdough starter culture kind of go crazy. So if you're looking for waking that <laughs> sourdough starter up, 
you can give it a boost of that and the next day it'll probably be ready to use. You'll see lots of bubbles and it'll probably double if not triple in size. Okay, so I've covered a majority of the wheat berry varieties and what I ge generally tend to use them for. But I told you at the end I would mention some of my favorite blends. So I kind of touched on it a little bit in the middle, but hard white and Kamut, I love to mix about 75 or 70 to 75% hard white and throw in that 25 to 30% Kamut in my breads in my pizza dough those are fantastic blends and i just i love to add those two together quite often when i'm making muffins i like to put about half soft white wheat and half spelt together and those make great muffins any of the recipes that i have listed on my blog you can generally mix and match same type of grains with without much of a change in the amounts. So if you want to use hard red instead of hard white in my recipe, it should be the same swap out. If you want to use spelt instead of kamut, or if you want to use einkorn instead of, you know, spelt or one of the recipes that I have listed, you may have a slight adjustment, but it shouldn't be very much. It, it will be probably pretty close. You'll just have to look at the dough when you're changing it out for a different grain. But generally, if you take, say I have a recipe pit written for 100% hard white wheat, and you want to add one of those other grains in it because you really like the taste or the quality or the texture, or you're almost out of hard white wheat, <laughs> any of those reasons, um, Generally, you can probably mix out just a small amount, like 20 to 30 percent, add that in and, you know, take out the hard white and put that in its place. And it shouldn't change the recipe amounts very much. So I try to write my recipes, letting you know how many, how much wheat berries you would need or if you prefer to weigh things, if you want the grams of how much it would weigh or the volume of flour, every baker is a little bit different and that's okay. That's what makes baking so fun. It's kind of an art and a science all in one. <laughs> and some people look at it more scientific and analytic and some people look at it more trial and error art. And I think there's room for all different bakers out there. So I try to write my recipes for all of you. <laughs> so I hope that's helpful to you. And I want to be a great resource for anyone that is new to milling their own grain or learning how to bake for the first time or transitioning has been baking for 30 or 40 years and is transitioning over to fresh milled flour because there's a huge learning curve and everything that you've ever been taught about baking in the past with just commercial flour or bread flour, all purpose flour, whatever, is thrown out the window <laughs> and a lot of those things that are like drilled into us that you know you you can't over need because if you over need it's going to have a problem and you're not going to get good bread well over kneading fresh milled flour is pretty hard to do so <laughs> under kneading is actually more of a common error in bread with fresh milled flour than over kneading so a lot of those things that we've been taught for so long if you've been baking for a long time you know what i'm talking about and those rules all seem to change when it comes to fresh milled flour. Same with sourdough, a lot of those things. You want an overnight ferment. Well, with fresh milled flour, it tends to over ferment quickly. So when you put it in the fridge overnight and you want it to ferment and get that sour flavor, it's almost too sour with fresh milled flour. It just eats it up a lot faster. So just a lot of those things are very different when we're using fresh milled flour. So I hope this video was helpful to you. And if you like this content and you want to learn more, don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell so you get the notifications when I'm putting out anything new. Also, you can jump over to my Facebook page at Grains and Small Places and there is where I'll post all my videos, all my blog posts. Sometimes I post something fun, sometimes I post new recipes, sometimes I post something embarrassing for me. <laughs> and we just have a really good time over there, so we'd like to have you over there, so come on and join us. And thank you for stopping by Grains and Small Places. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.